From the New Revised Standard Translation, the Word of God reads this way. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly, an angel touched him and said to him, get up and eat. He looked and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat. Otherwise, the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. At that place, he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elisha? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, as a thesis verse for the message this morning, please underline the following words in your Bibles. The angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, underline these words, get up and eat. Otherwise, the journey will be too much for you. Otherwise, the journey will be too much for you. Providence and guests with the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And under your prayers, we want to speak to you briefly this morning on the subject of thank you for my power. Thank you for my power. In this month of Thanksgiving, where we celebrate the idea of giving thanks, we want to continue on in our sermonic series of thankfulness. You will recall the last time I was before you, we preached to you on the subject of thank you for my pain. Though none of us like, enjoy, or embrace pain, we found from the prophet Jeremiah that it is in our pain where the divine listening ear of our God is inclined toward us and the divine promise of God's inevitable activity in our lives is provided to us. I can be thankful for my pain because in my pain, God will hear me and God will move on my behalf. This week, we not only come to the sanctuary thankful to God for our pain, but as we give thanks to God for God's many blessings toward us, we learn from the prophet Elijah that not only must we thank God for our pain, but you can thank God for your power. The truth of the matter is, every one of us in here has been in a situation or circumstance in your life where you know, had it not been for some Holy Ghost power in your life, you would have never made it. This is exactly, amen. This is exactly what the deacons mean when they sing for us on first Sundays, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, 
where would I be? Part of us thanking God for our pain is the lived experience of a Christian life that has taught us that our God will give you the power to press through your pain. And what we learn from scripture and from experience is that the situations and circumstances in our lives that cause our pain, the circumstances may not change. However, the power you need to make it through the pain is what comes from heaven. The shout moment of the sermon this morning and of the text is not that God provides you power, but when you learn how God provides the power here in the 19th chapter of 1 Kings when we think about the prophet Elijah. You should know that at the time of our text, you will remember the prophet Elijah has been winning and winning greatly with the Lord. Up to this point in the Bible, Elisha has had so many experiences, so many awesome and miraculous miraculous experiences with God that you would think his faith was unshakable and he would never experience any pain. If you simply back up two chapters in the Bible and you read the 17th and 18th chapters of the Bible of 1 Kings, you would realize that Elijah just keeps winning and it seems and appears to be in the text so spiritually in tune with God that nothing bad would ever happen to him. So then how is it in the 19th chapter of the text, just one chapter later, we find Elisha fleeing from Jezebel into solitude, going away from what she had planned for him. The reason is because the Bible is trying to let you know that no matter how holy you think you are, pain is a universal condition. It doesn't matter how good you've been to God or how good God has been to you. Pain is coming your way at some point in time. And if by the grace of God you have not experienced any pain in this life thus far, as grandma used to say, wait a minute, just live a little bit longer. Because struggle and pain and strife are the universal condition of being a human and they will eventually visit your front doorstep. The issue is not what will happen when the pain comes because the pain is coming. The issue is how will you respond when the pain makes it to your address? You remember how magnificent life, how magnificent Elisha's life was leading up to this chapter. By God's divine spirit, God used Elijah and he caused the rain to stop for more than three years. You remember that he was fed by ravens in the midst of a famine. You recall he witnessed a limitless jar of flour and a jug of oil in a time when flour and oil were scarce in the land. You recall he experienced the resurrection of a widow's son and you'll recall he beat the prophets of Baal when they challenged his prophetic prowess to a duel. In short, the 17th and 18th chapters of the book teach us that Elijah was on top, Elisha was winning. It appeared the Lord was always on the Elisha's side, and the Lord was so much with Elijah that his defense against pain would be almost impregnable and nothing could touch Elisha. Yet the 19th chapter opens by telling us that when Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had been doing in the previous chapters, verse 2 says Jezebel sent him a telegram. And the telegram read as follows, in short, by tomorrow this time I will take your life. And if I don't kill you by tomorrow this time, let the gods do worse to me than I had planned to do to you. You ought to know based upon Jezebel's history in the text, this was not a murder threat from Jezebel. This was a murder promise. She was promising to take Elisha's life, promising that she was going to take him out by tomorrow, by this same time. Now, I don't know about you, but it's hard for me to sleep at night when I know the most powerful woman in the land wants to kill me. It's hard for me to feel comfortable. It's hard for me to enjoy a meal. It's hard for me to binge on Netflix, Rhythm and Love Flow. It's a great show. Have you seen this? Come on, trivia. You know what I'm talking about. It's hard for me to really sleep well at night when I know the most powerful person in the land is threatening to kill me. The Bible says quite simply in the third verse that Elisha was afraid. But the depth of of the text that is used in the Hebrew is not just afraid as in he was fearful of what Jezebel might do. 
Elisha was afraid because after winning with God for two straight chapters, how am I going to begin the 19th chapter with the whole land trying to kill me? Elijah was afraid because if such a threat could come against him, maybe I've sinned against God and God has taken his hand off of me and Elijah knows what happens when God takes his hand off of his people. Elijah was afraid from the pain that we feel when other people threaten us, but we are not going to be able to threaten them because we don't live that way. So afraid was Elijah, so distressed was he by Jezebel's telegram, so problematic was the issues going on in his life that verse 3 tells us he got up and fled for his life. If you look at your text closely, don't read too fast or you'll miss too much. You'll notice he fled so fast that he left his servant where he was. I'm in verse 4. He fled until he sat down under a broom tree and he asked the Lord that he might die. The pain of his words mirror Jeremiah's struggle with the Lord from our sermon two weeks ago. It is enough, O Lord, he says. Take away my life. There it is. It's right there in the text. The prophet sat under a tree and told God, it is enough. Somebody right here can connect with the pain of Elijah as he has fled from his home. Lord, for two straight chapters, I did what you told me to do. I spoke what you told me to speak. I went where you told me to go. And now my reward for being faithful is that a treacherous leader named Jezebel is trying to take my life. Lord, it is enough. Have you ever been where Elijah is in the text? Have you ever been so tired and frustrated, so hurt and angry, so overwhelmed and impatient that you told the Lord, Lord, I thought you would never put more on me than I can bear, but I am at a point where there's more on my soldiers, more going on in my life, more stress on my brain than I can bear. Lord, it is enough. I'm only one mother taking care of multiple kids by myself, and now I've lost my job. God, it is enough. I am one student dealing with a racist campus that has racist administrators who are implementing racist policies from their racist power that they have over me. Lord, it is enough. I am one employee in an organization of evil that drains my joy every time I walk into the building, and going to work every day is tearing me down. Lord, it is enough. I am one parent who loved my precious gift. You called my loved one home before it was time. And every day I walk on this earth, I have to think about days that I am now going to miss, years and experiences that are not going to happen. Lord, it is enough. I am one retiree who did all that the company asked of me. And when I asked them simply to pay my pension as they promised, they cut my pension and they cut me. Lord, it is enough. I, I am one citizen in a country that has already put my people through slavery. Jim Crow civil rights, and now we got to deal with Donald Trump. And, and now, Lord, you want me to get excited to vote for another white Democrat that wants to use me for my vote during voting season and then kick me back in the field and put me under change whenever they get into the White House. Lord, it is enough. I am more tired than tired. I'm more sick than sick. I'm more frustrated than frustrated. And I'm right where Elijah is in this text. The Bible says in verse 5, so frustrated was Elijah, so agitated was Elijah, so spent and worn out with Elijah was he was with his life and dealing with Jezebel trying to kill him that he lay down under a broom tree and he fell asleep. Have you ever been there? Life is tearing you down so bad I just have to close my eyes. I have to close my eyes and go into an altered state of consciousness because, Lord, if I keep my eyes open and view the world as it is before me, the tears will overwhelm me. God, I have to close my eyes. I have to close my eyes because if I keep my eyes open and experience what is going on with me, the pain will press in on me so bad I just might scream. I got to close my eyes. I got to close my eyes because if I keep my eyes open and I don't get some help from my despair, I just might go crazy. I might nut up. I might go off. I might do something crazy. I might live wrong. 
wrong. I might do more for the devil than I'm doing for you. Lord, I just have to close my eyes. I have to close my eyes because if I try to look to the hills from whence cometh my help, if I don't get some help real soon, I might do something that I'm going to regret the rest of my life. I just have to close my eyes. My, my heart is too heavy. My pain is too worrisome. My struggle is too much. And Elijah just laid down closed his eyes. This is important in the text, brothers and sisters. I want you to experience what he's experienced. I want you to feel what he's feeling. And if you can't connect with Elijah right now in the text, as grandmother said, just live a while. I want you to see what he is seeing. And the reason why you've got to be down in the muck and the mire with Elijah is because my Bible says that the Lord, your God, takes care of the lilies of the valley. The Bible says the Lord your God would feed the broken sparrow. The, the Bible says that his eye is on the sparrow. And, and I believe, Lauren Hill, that if God is watching and his eye is on the sparrow, then God is watching over me too. And right there in the text, in the fifth verse, the Bible says, suddenly an angel touched him. Suddenly. Without warning or knowledge or forehand. Suddenly. Without notice or any idea, the angel was coming. Suddenly. Right when I needed him, sooner than right now and quicker than yesterday, suddenly. In my lowest moment, the Bible says an angel touched him. Now, in just one moment, the angel is going to start talking. And in just one moment in the sermon, I'm going to break down to you the magnitude of the angel's words. But before I tell you what the angel said, can we just stop right here and deal for a moment that when Elijah was in his lowest moment, when his despair was the greatest upon him, when he had to close his eyes based upon what he was dealing with, when he was asleep under a tree from the fatigue of pain, when he was down in the muck and the mire, right when he needed God the most God sent an angel to touch him. Now, that might not mean anything to you, but somebody in here can remember being in your lowest moment. Somebody in here remembers being down and out. Somebody in here remembers when you thought everybody had forgotten about you, and right when I needed him, right on time, the Lord sent an angel to touch me. I can think back to how bad my life was. I can remember how much struggle was upon me. And I realized when I look back over my life that right when I needed him sooner than right now, quicker than yesterday, God did not forget about me. God has never forgotten about me. And when I needed a touch from the Lord, the Lord sent an angel suddenly to touch me. Your angel might have come in the form of a friend or a foe. Your angel might have been a phone call or a feeling. But I can testify that when I needed him, right when I closed my eyes, right when I was ready to give up, right when I felt nobody understood, right when nobody could feel my pain, the Lord saw my need and sent me an angel. And this became my shout moment in the text. Listen, I can testify I wouldn't have a PhD right now if the Lord hadn't saw me down in Ann Arbor and sent me an angel. I, I never would have stepped in this pulpit if the Lord hadn't saw my despair and sent me an angel. There's no way I could go to funeral after funeral, funeral home after funeral home, cemetery after cemetery, and still preach this gospel if the Lord had not sent me an angel. The angel, the angel, the ones you didn't even know were coming on your behalf, the ones you didn't even realize were there, the ones who reminded you of what the song says, which is all day and all night I see angels and they're watching over me. And when I needed him the most, when I needed to depend on God the most, when I needed to lean on something greater than me the most, the Lord sent an angel. And I finally have gotten to a point in my life where I can testify out loud, do you realize it was not my intelligence that helped me get through? It wasn't my strength. It wasn't my human ingenuity. It wasn't my gut. It wasn't my experience. It wasn't my mommy or my daddy. It wasn't what I do for a profession or how many degrees I have. It was nobody but the Lord that sent me angel after angel angel after angel when I needed him. He sent an angel to watch over me. He sent an angel to help me. He sent an angel to cover me and to encourage me and to keep me in right when Elijah needed God the most. The Bible says he sent him an angel. Listen, some of your angels are strangers that you'll never meet again. Some of your angels are sitting next to you right now. 
Some of your angels are living and breathing, and they may not even know how God used them as angelic beings in your life, right? on time. I'm telling you this because sometimes it will strengthen your faith when you go back to people and you testify to them, baby, you will never know what you did for me. You will never know how low I was. You will never know how deep in sin I was. And all I know is that your prayer gave me power. Your presence gave me power. Your patience gave me power. And right when I needed you the most there, you were for me and lifted me right when I needed you. Listen, there was a time in my life, it was a Tuesday when my father called me and told me that he had cancer. I was worried about my dad. I was worried about my mom. I was worried about how they were going to make it through. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. And the very next morning, I had to get up and teach Bible study. I didn't feel like teaching Bible study. I didn't have it in me to teach Bible study. And so in my 12 p.m. Bible study, many of them will remember this, I stood up to start teaching the class, and the emotion overcame me. And I just started crying. Tears started coming down from my eyes because I wanted to get out of Atlanta and get home to be with my dad. And, and I said to myself, Damon, tighten up. You got to teach class, but I couldn't. The tears kept coming from my eyes, and the more I cried, the more my 12 p.m. members got up out of their seats, and they came over to me, and tears were in their eyes, and we just hugged, and we prayed. They will never know what they did for me that day. They, they will never know that right on time, when I needed God to send me an angel, there they were right on time. My, my dad didn't tell me on a Monday. He didn't tell me on a Thursday. He told me right when he knew I would see my members the very next morning. Thank God. God, he sent me an angel. And in the Bible, in the Bible, the angel just didn't show up. The angel spoke. He said to Elijah on two occasions, get up and eat. Otherwise, the journey will be too much for you. Get up and eat. Otherwise, the journey will be too much for you. Fill yourself with what you need to make it through the journey. Get up and eat so you can see the move of God with a full stomach and with open eyes. Get up and eat and realize that the Lord has never forgotten about you and the Lord will never forsake you. He says, get up and eat. Thank you for my power begins by point one, the fact that the Lord sends an angel. Point two, that the angel always has the words that I need to hear. This is the magnificent part of our God. God knows you so well that God knows exactly what you need to hear when you need to hear it. Isn't it good news that our angels speak to us as we have need and they give us the specific information exactly at the time we need to hear it? Uh, somebody in here can remember you heard exactly what you needed to hear listening to somebody else's prayer. You, you heard exactly what you needed to hear listening to somebody else's song. You, you heard exactly what you needed to hear when somebody called you and checked in on you. And the angel told Elijah exactly what Elijah needed to hear for the journey would be too much. The angel did not say, I'm going to kill Jezebel on your behalf. The angel didn't say, I'm going to remove Ahab and Jezebel from leadership. The angel didn't say, I'm going to restore you to authority and to power. The angel didn't say, I'm going to work this out as you want it worked out. The angel said, I'm not going to give you what you want, but I will always give you what you need. The reason I have to do it this way is because of my divine plan in your life, because of my divine plan for good to overcome evil, did you know that in your life, I need some actors and actresses to play the role of evil in this drama? So your journey has purpose, Elijah, for my divine will to be done. Elijah, if you're going to be on my side doing the work of good, then for the duality of all things in this life, since when there's up, there's down. When there's left, there's right. When there's on, there's off. If there's good, there's evil. Now, Elijah, if you're going to be playing the role of good in this drama called life that I'm living out, there has to be some actors and actresses playing on the role of evil. And if I take the evil out, it ruins the story. So I got to leave the evil in, but here's the consolation blessing. I will give you what you need to deal with the evil as long as you stay on the side of good. Everything he needed was given right there in the text. Get up and eat so you can make it through the journey. Did you know this is the good news of the text? But most people miss the point of what he's saying. Only because of Elijah's faithfulness in chapter 17 and 18 was Elijah spiritually aware enough to receive from the angel in chapter 19. I think you missed it. 
Let me say it again. Did you know you cannot live your life any old kind of way, ignoring God in the good times, then call on God in your pain and wonder why God has not come? Because our God is so awesome. God will always come in your life. God will always be there for you in the midst of your difficulty. The question is not, will God send an angel when I need him? The question is, are you spiritually in touch enough to receive from the angel when God sends the angel into your life? Power from God comes from the presence and the proclamation of the angel. But you've got to be in touch enough in the spiritual realm that when the angel comes, you are ready to receive from the angel. And here's why. Look at your Bible. Don't look at me. It's right here in the text. Notice in the text that after listening to the angel, Elijah does not speak to the angel. Look at the book. I'm not making this up. In the Bible, when the angel speaks to Elijah, Elijah does not speak back to the angel. He listens to what the angel has to say and he obeys what the angel tells him to do but he does not say anything to the angel this is important did you know that most of the time when God is trying to bless you and telling you what you need to do you and I do much more talking than we do listening and obeying and every now and then, if you want to really receive your blessing from heaven, when someone comes into your life and tells you to do something, before you respond, I can't, I won't, it won't work, it won't happen, God won't, the people won't, it doesn't happen. Before you get to talking, why not try listening and obeying before we get to speaking? You don't have to say amen, I know I'm right, it's right here in the text. And he says, get up and eat. Now watch this. He got up, he ate, and he drank. This should bother you. Did you know in Elijah's day, they didn't have microwaves? <laughs> Did you know that in the days of Elijah, they didn't have Uber Eats? So if the angel tells Elijah to get up and eat, somebody has to cook. But if you look closely in the text, the Bible says when he got up, the cooked food the Bible gives you specificity. Look at the book. Don't look at me. Look at the book. As if it was prepared on a hot stove, was already at Elijah's head. Now, I'm confused. If I'm listening to the angel, who's cooking the food? This is what you should be asking yourself. And you then should realize in your life, that you serve a God who every now and then, when you choose to be obedient, God will do the legwork on your behalf. Uh, there's some people in here who can shout right now, you got some things going on in your life you didn't work for, you didn't do the cooking, but God laid out the meal. You, you don't deserve that job, but you got it anyway. You didn't work for that degree, but you got that anyway. You didn't do what you were supposed to do, but God kept making a way out of no way. Uh, because when I listen and obey, uh, my God is so good, he will provide and provide and provide again. Now look back at your text. Stop looking at me. Look at the text. He gets up, he eats, and he drinks. Look at the Bible. And because he obeyed the Lord, what he ate was enough to satisfy him for 40 days and 40 nights. <laughs> because it came from God, it lasted. You missed it in the text. Every now and then, when you and I are in pain and when we are in trouble, one of the reasons why we stay in pain is we keep trying human remedies for our spiritual sickness. And my human remedy doesn't last that long, which is why I got to keep popping pills. I got to keep calling you. I got to keep trying to you. But every now and then, when I'm in pain and I'm in despair, if I would call on the Lord and do what the Lord told me to do, my God's got staying power. It'll, it'll last from day after day. It'll last from night into night because God is able. He got up. And he ate and he drank because he needed the strength for the journey. And if you look at the Bible closely, it says he went to Horeb, to the Mount of God. And when he got there, the book says the word of the Lord came to him. 
My power comes from the presence of the angel. My power comes from the word that the angel speaks. But everybody in here knows that my power comes from God's holy word. Because it is the word of God which gives me strength from day to day. Now normally, it's at this point in time in the sermon when you're preaching 1 Kings 19. In preacher school, they teach you that right here is when you should start to have the people shout about the word of the Lord. There's a long little run that we could do to get you excited about the word of the Lord and how the word of the Lord does this and the word of the Lord does that. And we all could get excited and jump up and down and say hallelujah and run around the church. But if you get to the word of the Lord too fast, you'll miss the most important part of the text. Here it is. The angel only told Elijah to get up and eat. He only said he needed to eat to have enough strength for the journey. But if you look closely at the text, the angel never tells Elijah what the journey is. So you're a reasonable person. How did Elijah know to leave the solitary broom tree and to go to Horeb, to the Mount of God, to receive the word of the Lord if the angel didn't tell him. I'm confused. I, I want to know from you, Bible scholars, how after he fled Jezebel in fear and distress, how after lying down under the tree asking the Lord to take his life, and after he told the Lord it is enough, how after he closed his eyes because he was dealing in distress, how did Elijah muster the power and the wherewithal to get to Horeb where God was waiting if the angel only told him to eat but never told him where to go? I'll wait. Because somebody in here knows the answer. Somebody in here remembers when you were at this same point in your life. You were obedient to the guidance and the wisdom and the advisement of the angel. And what happened in your life, you'll remember, is that when you finally listened to the angel, and you obeyed whatever the angel told you to do in your life. You, you got to a point where you tuned the internal spiritual radio in your body to the frequency of heaven. You realize that once I listened to the Lord one time, the goodness of my God is that if I will obey him one time, my God keeps on talking in my life. And I don't need the text to tell me where to go because now I'm talking with God direct. I listened to the angel. God sent the preacher as my angel. He sent the deacon as my angel. He sent the friend as my angel. But once I listened to the angel one time, I don't need the preacher anymore. I don't need the deacon anymore. I can hear direct direct from heaven. I can hear direct from God and God will tell me what I need to know and where I need to go. Your power comes from the fact that the Lord never stops talking in your life. The Lord will keep on instructing. The Lord will keep on guiding. Elijah needed a little boost from an angel coming to him under that tree because he was so down in pain. But once he got that boost, everything he needed to keep on trucking for the Lord was given to him and he ended up at Horeb receiving the word of the Lord. Here it is. For 40 days and 40 nights, the Lord kept him. And when he finally gets to the word of the Lord, when he finally plugs into heaven, now he's got the power. Brothers and sisters, I've come this morning to tell you that you can thank God for your pain because God will move in the midst of your pain. But one of the reasons why in the midst of our pains we ought to be thankful is because whenever I feel pain, I know power ain't far behind. Whenever I feel struggle, pain and power is not far behind. And when I 
get the power of the Lord in my life. Uh, somebody can testify when I feel the power of the Holy Spirit moving over me. Uh, then I know he is my redeemer. He is my tear wiper. He is my peacemaker. He is my Lord and Savior. And I can handle anything. I can deal with anything. I can face anything. Because devil, as you bring the pain right behind it, the Lord will. The Lord will bring the power. Thank you, God, for my power. God bless you, Father.